And good morning again. We are in the book of Philippians as we were last week. I think I'm probably going to keep working through Philippians till we get to the, uh, we start going through, I think it's 2 Thessalonians, or 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, we go, and that will get us all the way to, uh, to Advent. Uh, we left off last week with the, the Paul telling us uh, in verses 29 to 30 in chapter 1, where he was graciously, excuse me, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And that is where he left off to lead into what we're talking about today, which is the second chapter, verses 1 to 13. And that, that is on page 9, or 954 uh, in the Pew Bible. We are supposed to imitate Christ's humility. That is the section that we are looking at. So let's look at Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. If then there is any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy, make my joy complete, be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he existed in the form of God and did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, assuming human likeness and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him even more highly and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that in the name given to Jesus every knee, knee shall bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Okay, the last part there is talking about working on your own salvation. That doesn't mean that you can get your own salvation by any means. That means you need to to uh, work on getting yourself right with God because that's how you're saved, is be right with Christ, having faith in Christ. And we do need to work on that because all of us, our faith goes up and down as we go through life. We, none of us can say that we go like this. So maybe Terry, right Terry, there's, there's a common ascent or a, a continued ascent right up into the heavens. That's not the way it works. We all run into these stumbles and bumps and we, we waver, but we need to work on that. Having stronger and more intense faith at all times. Now, then we're going to look at verses 5 through 11, and we'll leave the top, the first four verses to last. These verses are considered to be an ancient hymn. Um, it, it, uh, it probably predates Paul, is what most scholars think, that Paul is using something that probably came into existence fairly quickly. Um, it is a, it is almost an aff it's an affirmation of faith is what it really is. It's almost a creed. Now we are made up of disciples, which is the Stone Campbell movement, and Baptists, and therefore both of those lines, because the, the Stone Campbell Campbell movement was influenced by the Baptist movement before they kind of became their own thing, um, they're non-creedal churches. So we don't use creeds. We don't use affirmations of faith. No, no creed but Christ is what we what we affirm. And I like that, and I don't like that. Because the thing about creeds and affirmations of faith is it keeps you focused. And there are times when I feel like we have missed the mark a little bit when we never. Now I've used the creeds a couple of times, and usually I think the Apostles' Creed. But those things kind of help to remind us what our base is, to shore up our base. Um, we use communion as, as to shore up our base. We remember that the base is the body and the blood of Christ, which it is. But there's more to it than that. But this is thought to be a hymn. And the thing about hymns are, and music, is that it's easier to remember stuff when you sing it, isn't it, Terry? 
In fact, that's a memorization technique that some people use to memorize things. They sing it. They make it into, or they make it into a rhyme or a poem. You know, they make, make these little things, I forget what they're called, these memory tricks that you, know, that you, uh, that you have. Uh, I know that Jim Bruce used them for a lot of things, for, for memory, little exercises in memory. But music is one of those things. So that's one of the reasons why this would have been in, a, in the form of a hymn. So verses 5 through 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. That does not mean there um, that he existed in the form of God. That doesn't mean he was kind of like God. In the Greek, it's a lot stronger than it is in English. He was God. There's not a, it's not a something that we debate. He was God. And that is one of the things that, that is in the creeds that we don't use that some, for some ministers, unfortunately, I know ministers in both, move, both movements, the DOC and the ABC, that don't believe Jesus was divine. If we used a creed, that would be an issue. He was divine. Trust, you have to trust me on that. But don't trust me, trust the Bible. He emptied himself. Now that doesn't mean that he became not God. Because the other thing that we believe is that God was fully human and fully God, that Jesus was rather. In fact, when there are some denominations, some Christians that cross themselves, and different ones, the Orthodox, cross themselves like this, and they go from, I get, see if I get this right, from head to heart, from right to left. The, the Catholics go from left to right. But the Orthodox do this movement with their hands when they're doing that. Catholics will do this. The Orthodox do this, and there's a reason for that. These three fingers represent the Trinity. These two fingers represent the fully humanness and the fully divine of God. So that's the symbolism of that. So that is, if I could go right to left, is what, if I remember right, is what the Orthodox do. They're backwards of the Catholics. Um, we need to remember that. He didn't become not God, is the point. He's still fully God. He put on humanness, but he became fully human. It's, we're coming up on our Halloween, which that's a, a good conversation about whether we should be celebrating Halloween or not, but let's not focus on that. It's kind of like you put on a costume for Halloween, okay? And say you put on a pirate costume for, for Halloween, and that, was your, that, that is your costume for Halloween. That wouldn't be like what Jesus did. Even if you went around and said R about everything, that wouldn't be like what Jesus did. Jesus was fully immersed. Jesus would be like you removing an eye so that that patch was there and chopping off a leg so you had a big leg. You're fully immersed and you went out on the seven seas and raided ships. You're, he, you're all in. You're all pirate. Even though underneath that costume, you're still whoever you were. This is, he is fully God and fully man. And that's something you can't emphasize enough. You need to always remember that. He emptied himself, means he let go of her temporarily, he put off those powers. So he took them back up in the transfiguration. When he was transfigured before the, the, the apostles, the three that went with him, they saw Jesus for what he was, who he was, beyond his human. They saw him as fully God on that mountain. So he didn't get rid of it. It was there. He just had to decide to use it. And he would use little bits of it when he healed people, didn't he? When he did miracles, he's using a little, only a little bit of being God because being God is something we can't begin to comprehend. He humbled himself. Think about this. We don't, it's difficult for us to grasp what heaven is like. What is heaven going to be like? Well, it's not going to, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more suffering, there'll be no, no more fear, and all of these things that we, that we look at as being human, and where there's no more of that, no more, no more jealousy, no more anger, no, no more whatever. We can look at that as this, it is, it, it, it is this, this ethereal existence, this heavenly Existence. That's only the great, the only word I can use, Terry. It's heavenly. But what's heaven for God? 
so much more than what we're going to experience. We can't hardly put a wrap, we can't wrap our brain around what heaven's going to be like. Guess what? We can't at all wrap our brain around what Jesus' existence was before he came to earth. Because he pre existent, he existed before anything, before time, whatever time is. But Jesus existed in that pre existent divine state, that omnipotence, omnipotent, omni whatever. Constantly being worshipped, that's part of what I believe heaven is strongly, is that heaven is, God is worshipped constantly, 24-7, 365, though there is no time, so how are you going to mark that one out? And he loved you so much, he left that. And he spent 30-some years suffering on earth as a human being, Stubbed his toe. He's fully human. If he stubbed his toe, it hurt just as bad as you or I. I mean, people insult him, people ridicule him, people torture him, and people crucify him. And he knew it was coming. And he loved you enough, he came anyway. That's what we need to realize about the incarnation. Christ. He loved you so much. He loved me so much, even though I know fully well I'm really not particularly lovable. He came to this earth and left all that behind to give you that lesson. Therefore, God exalted him even more highly when he, when he ascended and took his place as part of the Trinity, gave him the name that is above all names, so that at the name given to Jesus, every knee shall, should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He has assumed his righteous place, his correct place, his divine place, we need to lift up our tongues in glory. We need to kneel before the throne of the Lord. Because someday we will. We'll have to answer for all those things we did that compiled the hurt on him at the cross. Because on the cross, this sinless being took on all, and realized that God despises and abhors sin. God can't even be in the presence of sin. Did you know that? That's one of the things that we believe. God can't be in the presence of sin. He doesn't want to be anyway. It's painful to God to be in the presence of sin. And yet Jesus came into the body to be with all of us sinners. And then he took our sin upon him. That thing that's, you know, we don't like to be dirty. We don't like to be covered in manure and all of that. But it's impossible to understand the magnitude of worse. Our sin being piled on Jesus on that cross was. Think of it that way. And then let's talk about the first four verses. He's talking about that suffering. He says that there's any comfort in Christ, any consolation from love, any partnership in the Spirit, any tender affection and sympathy. All of those things come to us through the sacrifice of Christ. Even though we know we're suffering, we get this comfort. We always tell people, God's comfort be with you in their suffering or loss or pain or injury. We console them with the love of God. We want them to have a relationship with God. We want our children. That's why we bring the children to church. That's why we try to raise them up. So they have that, that relationship. Tender affection and sympathy. God has all those things for you because he bore the pain of the body for you. But then Paul says, and remember, Philippians is the, the, the epistle of joy. And here he says it again. Make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourself. Let each of you look not on your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And that verse we repeated because that was part of the other verse. But it's the end of this. We're supposed to be in the mind of Christ Jesus. And what is the mind of Christ Jesus? What is the mind of God? 
love, but reconciliation. God wants us to work together. I told the children, we're supposed to be the hands and the feet. And guess what happens if the one hand is going this way and one hand's going that way? Are you going to get anything done or are you going to blow the whole thing up? In 1 Corinthians, Paul tells them to be slaves, that we are slaves of the Lord. But the word for slaves that he uses there is a special word, slaves. That's in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. I didn't look it up because it just popped in my head, Diana. But in that verse, it's a special kind of slave. It's a galley slave. Galley slaves do what? They row a boat. And they have to be rowing together. They need to be in unison. They need to be cooperating. That's what we're called to do. We're called to be the hands and feet, but we're called to pull together, not apart. We don't want one, I go this way, you go that way. We're going to blow the whole thing up. That ship, if those guys on this side are rowing one way and the guys on this ship outside are rowing the other, that ship's just going to sit there and spin. Or if they're rowing different directions, all of them, those oars are going to clack and clatter and they're, they're going to get broken, and then that ship's going nowhere. And it's just a drift. We need to be on the same page. That's in Scripture over and over, folks. I didn't look that up either because it just popped to me as I was sitting back here. There are so many places in the Bible where it tells us to work together. And there are so many times that when they pick the lectionary, they pick those verses. And why do you suppose that is? Because it's important. The things that keep coming up over and over are important. That's an important thing. It's just as important as remembering the divinity of Christ. Because I'll present to you that if we're not working together, are we really remembering that Jesus is divine? Are we really remembering that he's our savior? Or are we just in it for our own egos? We're in it for our own egos. Yoke and shake his head. I, I agree, Yoke. We're in it for our own egos if we're fighting and squabbling about silly things. And I warn you of that for one reason, well, for many reasons, because it is something that's very important. But we do have something coming up here in the next three months and three years that you may not realize. This sanctuary, this, type, this building that we are in, the old park, is going to be 100 years old in three months and three years. And we need to start thinking now about what we're going to do. If we're going to celebrate that, if we're going to have to do something special for that, if we're going to do some things to the sanctuary to make sure that it's going to last another hundred years, because that's what we're supposed to do, is to carry this into the future. Now, whether we use this building or we use another building, that's in, we can debate that one, perhaps, and we'll, we'll follow God. But this is a perfectly good building. It stood the test of time. It's blessed and nurtured so many Christian souls. We have a duty to God and to all those other souls who work so hard to keep this building going to do the work of God. We're going to have to talk about things like the carpet and the walls and whatnot. And the number two thing that splits church, and I've told you this before, number one is the music and number two is the color of the new carpet. Let's remember that not only in the things about this church, the, or the 100 year anniversary, but all of the things about the church, everything that we deal with in this church and its ministry, that we are here to serve one thing and one thing only, and that's Christ Jesus. And if we're not doing that, if we're arguing amongst ourselves, if we're getting our egos in a Fine, and that includes me because I got the biggest ego in the place probably, and my wife will confess that that's true. And I have to constantly be beaten down by the Lord to make sure that my ego's in check. And he does a really good job of it some days. But we need to remember that. Let's be a blessing to the next generation and the generation beyond. Let's keep this building beautiful, let's keep this church loving, let's keep everything going for God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for Paul's message here to the church in Philippi. 
Thank you for the reminder that we need to work together. We need to be like those folks rowing that galley. We need to be in unison. We need to be listening to the cadence, and that cadence is coming directly from you, God. And Lord, let us be tuned into that. Let us be listening always for your voice, your spirit. We pray this into your grace.